Okay, we're going to move into our next session, and uh, we've got Sharon Fagan here to kick it off. Okay, um, so Susan told me my first uh, thing to do was to get everybody revved up. <laughs> so I, and I think that, um, you know, the pace of change and the innovation in mobility is really phenomenal. And I just want to reiterate what everyone said already, which is that this is a first. Um, the breadth of participants here representing all these different modes and also representing business, government, nonprofits, academics. All, we've got all these sectors here in the room. So um, I think it's really exciting. And this is going to be a PowerPoint presentation now. And it's, um, it's going to be very, very fast. But after this, I think the entire rest of this conference, it's discussion. Because we really want to hear from everybody. We want everybody participating in this. This is just to set the stage. So um, I'm going to go over some of the big mega trends, and then Susan's going to talk about the definitions of all these different modes. And then Tim is going to give us the vision and how we uh, put it all together. So, um, but before I start, I just want to, um, I do want to recognize Susan and her team, because it really is phenomenal that she's gotten everybody to be in this room, because as some of you may know, not everybody in this room has worked with everyone. Some of you compete with each other and have a lot of differences. And Susan's uh, brilliance, really, in this was uh, spending a lot of time with a lot of you and, and pulling everyone together. So I just want to give a round of applause for Susan first. OK, so now the trends in 10 minutes. <laughs> Uh, so, oh, and, okay, All right. <laughs> and I don't know how this works, but anyway, but the biggest trend, the first thing, of course, are, is cities, right? So our cities are growing, and, uh, and they're growing fast, and you know, what we have happening, we had all this spreading out to the suburbs, and now young people want to be back in the city, and companies want to be back in the city. In Chicago, United Airlines, M Motorola, I mean, they m went from their suburban campuses back into the center of the city. So we're looking for the future to have cities as the economic engine of growth. And that's happening not only in the US, but it's happening worldwide. Uh, and then we get to the millennials. And there, there were two studies released just in the last uh, couple weeks. And they were both uh, very similar and very interesting, I think because they, show, they point to this change in what people want out of the transportation system. And the thing that's most interesting, I, I think, is that um, millennials are really looking at getting more out of it, not just, how to, not just get to the destination, but basically multitasking along the way. So it's great to bike because you can get your exercise in while you're getting to work. It's great to be on the train with Wi-Fi because you can also do some work and check your email while you're on the train. So uh, this is really uh, an important change and, and trend. Um, and then we have um, the baby boomers, or the aging population, which is uh, you know getting older. It's a big, huge cohort. And what we are finding is that this group of people also wants to be in the city, also wants to stay connected and engaged, and needs to get around. And as it becomes uh, more difficult to drive a single occupancy car, this, this group is becoming a bigger and bigger uh, cohort looking for alternatives, looking for new options like paratransit, shuttles, private vans, car sharing, all of these things. As, as people move back in the city. Um, and then I know you all know this, that you know, we're, we're getting connected. We have uh, big data. And this is really important in our transportation planning because it means that we do have this real-time information. And we have this opportunity to take all this information and use it to enhance our transportation and our planning. Um, at the same time, 
climate change is real, and we have a whole series of uh, weather changes that we've all witnessed, you know, dramatic ones, right? Flooding, drought, fires, the big ones. And so cities are starting to figure out how to handle this. We all have to figure out how to handle it. So we're talking about resiliency, and we're also talking about really trying to solve some of these issues. And some of that has to do with um, new developments that are occurring in around energy. And we see prices coming down for solar, it becoming more feasible. We see that um, the batteries, there's a lot of work being done. It's not there yet, but batteries will be really will be able to put power back on the grid. So your car can be plugged in and it can be part of a community um, power station. At the same time, um, our trends are changing in terms of our work patterns, right? We don't, not everybody is heading downtown spending the day in the office. We're working out of coffee shops. We're working out of our neighborhood. We're working out of our homes. And as we change those patterns, we have to think about the flexibility and the changes that we need in the transportation system. The other thing that's happening when we're working at home and working in our neighborhoods is we're ordering things online to be delivered. So there's a whole uh, area of delivery that is happening. In, um, in London, they reduced congestion from cars by uh, imposing a congestion tax, and then there's been a rise in delivery vans in central London. So it, it's, it's, um, you know, it's a very interesting new phenomenon. Um, and then on the national level, uh, because of all these changes, because cars are getting more efficient, because our vehicle miles traveled are going down, and because fewer people are actually getting driver's licenses, what we find is that the money from the gas tax is also going down. And the gas tax is what has funded so much of the infrastructure. So as we go forward, um, we are also looking for innovation in this area, innovative funding sources and public-private partnerships, because it's not going to happen by government funding alone. And so there's a lot of this growing up and this is going to, going to continue. And I just want to highlight the thing about the driver's licenses because this is a new trend. I'm, it's, it's started happening a little bit, but it, it's the numbers that came out just very recently are really large. I mean, 28 percent decrease in driver's licenses amongst 18 to, I think it was 34 year olds. So, um, then we have the idea of access instead of ownership. And um, access actually trumping possession. And this is what we see as we see this rise in the sharing economy. So there's a whole set of companies that have been growing up on this idea that we're not going to own, but we're going we're to have access to a variety of, of services through renting, through subscriptions, pay per use. And some of this that's happening is just about having it when you need it, not having the hassle when you don't. And another part of it is actually being part of a community of people who are doing a similar thing. So we're, we're making this shift in behaviors actually where people are going from uh, your identity is the car you own to your identity is you're part of a community. And that's why, um, you know, in car sharing and a lot of these things, there are a lot of gatherings. People get to know the people who use the same car as them. They want to come to parties because it's part of a change where um, you can belong and your identity is actually um, is, is in, in, in doing something that's good for the environment, but that's also cost effective and convenient for you. And so then we get to um, all the new modes. And some of these have been around and they're coming back. And I just wanted to highlight that. Susan's going to go into to all the various sharing modes. But um, the other thing that's happening in public transportation is we have this rise of 
interest in um, bus rapid transit, and we have bus rapid transit systems being planned and developed in, in really all the major um, uh, regions of the country. And we have um, a lot of trams, we, what we're finding is that the transportation systems that were actually torn out of many of our, our major cities um, years ago are being put back in. I think LA is the best example, you know, that had this phenomenal public transportation system in 1920, and now it's uh, trying to resurrect that by putting in an extensive uh, transportation system. So, uh, and then, of course, I wanted to mention the uh, driverless cars because um, there are a lot of new technology evolving as well. And now, I'm going to turn it over to Susan, who's going to go on to the definition. Okay, I'm back with my PowerPoint. I'll be back later, too, <laughs> with a PowerPoint. So, uh, so I have been tasked uh, to do the definition section. So that sounds kind of academic, like, right? Okay. Uh, <laughs> so as you can see here, we have many types of shared transportation. We've got public transit, taxis, limos, things that we are all very familiar with and have known about for a long time. And ride sharing is another one of those, although there's a lot of developments in this space uh, to make it more real time. We've got car sharing, scooter sharing now, shuttle services that we heard about briefly um, from Scott Wiener, bike sharing, transportation network companies, and Jitney services. So there's so many shared use uh, transportation modes that we really need to examine. And uh, this space is really evolving rapidly, as we've talked about. And so why are we talking about definitions? Well, it's starting to become more and more important to actually really define things clearly because there's very significant policy implications. And understanding the differences and similarities among these different modes is very important. And so lines are getting blurry and it's starting to look like a continuum of services. So that's why we're dedicating a bit of time today to these definitions. So public transit, as you know, buses, trains, ferries, all of these wonderful modes that have been getting us around that are typically publicly owned fleets and services, and we all rely on them very much. Taxis and limousines for higher services, and we're familiar with these as well. And they can be uh, prearranged, hailed, uh, all sorts of different things. They can be paid by cash or by app. And I imagine that the taxi industry is going to be evolving quite rapidly as well as we move forward with advances in Wi-Fi and Internet. And then I, the next slide is focused on this classification of ride sharing. And I, I don't think it's a surprise to anybody in this room that there's been a pretty heated debate about this category <laughs> in the last 12 months. And so... What we know is that there are services that have been around w for us a long time, carpooling and van pooling. Carpooling it can also include uh, family pools. Van pooling typically involves uh, work trips to and from uh, a job center with a van. And we're seeing more advances in real-time ride sharing, at, which match uh, passengers and drivers based on des destinations, and typically through an app. And uh, one of the companies that uh, I've been talking to about their, their work is called Karma. They're formerly Avego, and they were telling me recently that their average trip length with real-time ride sharing is approximately 25 miles, and I find that quite fascinating. And a lot of their trips appear to be intercity, not intracity, uh, particularly in the areas where they're deploying their system, including the Bay Area. And one of the things they, they wanted me to throw out for you to think about is, should we be thinking about this as a new term, real-time carpooling services, to maybe help us clarify what is carpooling from what may not be actually ride-sharing? So this next category is the one I've studied the longest, about 17 years of my life, and it is rapidly advancing and evolving and continuing to grow. 
uh, round trip classic car sharing is where we all pretty much got started and essentially go into and out of the same location, pay by the hour and mile. We have a range of business models that operate these fleets, ranging from nonprofits, cooperatives, to for-profit companies. And we have uh, several of these services here right in the San Francisco Bay Area. Another uh, type of car sharing is peer-to-peer -peer car sharing. And this is where individuals actually share their own personal vehicles in a car sharing fleet. And these services are typically managed by a third party. One-way car sharing, also known as point-to-point -point car sharing and uh, free-floating car systems, this is the idea that people pay by the minute and they can actually take their vehicle and leave it at a different location. There's actually two forms of one-way car sharing. There's actually uh, station-based and free-floating. So there's a lot of developments in this space uh, of the, the whole car sharing arena. And then the final category, we haven't really seen mm, so much activity in yet, but this is one of the categories I've been very excited about for several years, and that's fractional ownership. And this is the idea that individuals sublease or subscribe to a vehicle owned by a third party. So I just wanted to take a minute to give you some statistics on car sharing, because I track this stuff pretty regularly. Around the world today, we're somewhere at about probably 2.5 to 2.8 million members in car sharing. We do a census every two years, so I'm not quite sure exactly where that number lies. We have expanded our uh, tracking to include the Americas, Brazil, Mexico, Canada, and the US. And today, there are now 46 operators. These statistics actually do not include peer-to-peer -peer car sharing operators. And of these 46 operations, there's now 1.2 million members sharing over 20,800 vehicles as of July 2013. So this is the first time I'm sharing those numbers. So those are impressive. One-way car sharing, we have operations in nine countries, five companies just in 11 cities uh, in uh, Canada, Mexico, uh, we have a launch plan for Indianapolis, which will be an all-electric. And another statistic that I think is quite interesting is One Way represents 12% of the North American car sharing membership and 16% of the fleet size. So One Way has been growing, and later I will be talking a little bit about how it's shifted just within the last 12 months in terms of business models. And personal vehicle sharing or peer-to-peer -peer car sharing, we first saw it in 2001, uh, folks like Ego Car Share and Rent My Car. As of September of this year, 10 operative uh, personal vehicle sharing companies, three planned, and 38 worldwide. Scooter sharing. So this is the idea that uh, we're filling the niche between cars and bicycles. And we have an electric scooter sharing system here in San Francisco called Scoot. And one is about to launch in pilot form in Barcelona called Motit. Next, we have uh, corporate regional shuttles. So we did hear a little bit uh, from the supervisor about these shuttle services. So essentially, there's two types. The first is the corporate regional shuttle. And this is employer-funded regional transit. So this is uh, what some people are referring to, the Google bus. Uh, but there's many other operators, um, including Genentech, Apple, Facebook that are leading companies in this space. And San Francisco is actually very much on the cutting edge of the growth in shuttle services. Pretty interesting statistics come from this space. 45 million um, uh, vehicle miles traveled or vehicle kilometers traveled reductions coming from this space, 11,000 tons of GHG reduced, and 35,000 boardings per day in just the regional in inter San Francisco shuttle service area. So this is actually something to watch and it's gaining, as I said, a lot of attention. The second category are local shuttles that are also employer-based and they actually take the people to and from the transit hub. So the first category, limited stops, uh, employer pays for it and takes them directly to uh, their employment center. Public bike sharing. 
Uh, we've got a lot of development and lots of buzz here. It's growing exponentially around the world. We have so many people tracking it. Russell Medding, my friend here, uh, who's been helping so much with the summit, tells me that uh, as of this month, there are 636 public bike sharing systems operating across the globe today. I mean, that is phenomenal growth. Because a lot of this got started you know, with the Baylib systems, the city of Lyon, many of these systems in the mid-2000s. So the growth here is, is just crazy. Uh, all of these systems sharing uh, over 584,000 bikes at over 29,000 stations. And Russell tells me that there have been 100 and new, 120 new city programs launched just since January of this year including Bay Area Bike Share. So this is an area to watch, and I think a lot of people are excited about it. Uh, a few definitions here, because uh, most of you may be familiar with the public bike sharing systems. There's also a lot of growth happening into other categories. So classic bike sharing is point to point, also round trip. People pay typically for the first half hour of it, and it's fleet operated, docking station based. You'll see uh, more about this uh, if you're attending the mobile workshop today, bike sharing workshop, and also there'll be a lot of discussion about this later in the conference. Another form of bike sharing is closed community bike sharing. Campuses uh, have these closed memberships, so this is university campuses as well as corporate campuses. They're mainly round trip, and um, some are actually linking to car sharing as well. And in, we have city car share uh, starting an electric bike sharing uh, system, and we also have uh, a system run by Buffalo uh, Bike Share, and I think we're going to hear about both of those systems. And finally, peer-to-peer -peer bike sharing. And so this is the idea similar to uh, car sharing, where individuals share uh, their bikes on a uh, rental basis by the hour or daily, and also through bike rental shops. Transportation network companies. Uh, this is our new category of transportation services. And uh, California Public Utilities Commission, they'll be with us today, uh, helped us to define this new category. And this is the idea of prearranged trips by app to pay and connect passengers with drivers who use their personal vehicles. Uh, it's been attracting a lot of controversy and inattention. I'm sure you're aware of that. Uh, there are five uh, transportation network companies just in um, California, Instacab, Lyft, Sidecar, Tick and Go, UberX are among uh, a few of those. And then I will conclude uh, with Jitney Services. And uh, we are actually going to be um, uh, joined tomorrow by David King, one of uh, our colleagues um, from academia, who has been studying jitneys. And uh, he tells me that the term jitney, which I did not know before David told me this, actually is derived from the term nickel fare. And I thought that was pretty fascinating. And the world of jitneys is actually heating up quite a bit. It's actually attracting some policy attention on the safety side. These are typically licensed uh, vehicles and often known as commuter vans. Other terms that you might have heard of include dollar vans. This is a popular term in New York City, Emma vans in New Jersey, and uh, Carmenitas in California. They exist in many major cities, but what's interesting is that LA, San Francisco, San Diego have experimented with these systems and uh, have not been able to uh, maintain them successfully. So many of those systems have ceased operations. But a leader in this space is indeed New York City. It has approximately 800 vans and about 120,000 riders per day. So. That's it for definitions. I can't think of anything that I missed, but if you think of something, let me know. And I'm going to ask Timothy to join us to talk about policy and vision. Thank you, Susan, and uh, thank everybody for being here. Susan, we may have to look at um, helicopter sharing in Sao Paulo, so we'll, 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 we'll look at that. Um, so welcome, everybody. My name is Tim Papandreou. I'm the uh, Deputy Director for Planning at, at SFMTA. Um, it's an exciting time to be here. And, and I'm going to go through a few policy areas and then look at some of the vision of how we kind of put all this together and, and what does this actually mean. And we kind of drew from a lot of the pieces to, uh, that will be discussed in the conference in the next two days. Um, but here are some of the key things to think about and kind of pique your interest and get that conversation going. 
On the governance side, you know, really, we've got multiple providers, lots and lots of providers. We have, we have a lot of people uh, you know, innovating and bringing out some new ideas. And there's partnerships forming, some are forming uh, more cohesively, some are, some are having some challenges. But that piece of the partnership is going to be a discussion that we really need to explore in more detail. One of the things that we need as, uh, in these partnerships is the idea of sharing the data, because the data helps both. It doesn't have to be personal data. It can be aggregated by a third party. But those who share will probably see more of these um, opportunities in partnership grow. And I think that's something that many cities around the world that we talk to, uh, I work in the city of San Francisco, we have, a, we have a network of cities, about about 200 cities around the world that we talk about these things. We keep saying again and again, those who share data and those who are more transparent will see more of these partnerships happen. So it's a real, it's, and it's, a, it's a balancing point because you don't want to share too much because you, you may be on a competitive edge. And so, so we're going to have to think about this more and more. And then what our role is really in cities and governments across the, the, the world is we need to balance multiple city objectives. There's social equity, there's the economy, there's the environment, there's quality of life. There's make, our role is to really make things fair. And so I think there's a lot of learning on both sides. And if we're both open and we both engage in, in, in those conversations, I think we'll have success. The second one, which is something that really I feel uh, as, a, as a transportation plan or a plan engineer is this customer-focused integration. We've had historic funding um, decisions made in the past to really have these silos. And, uh, and we really are focused on where the money comes from, what you can use for that money, what that money can be, uh, can be implemented with. And it creates a lot of um, silos or cylinders of excellence for, for those in the public sector that we really need to start broadening that out and, and open ourselves up. And that thinks, looks at you know, the modes, how we treat modes, how we treat routes, how we treat insurance, how we treat the booking and the payment systems, all of these things uh, you'll see in a little bit of, of what this looks like. And then scaling up, we've had, you know, Susan mentioned some really great statistics. Um, I know Susan for over a decade, we hate to admit it because we used to be kids, um, and when I did my thesis on this, I was, I was convinced we're going to have like a quarter million car sharing uh, services by, by now, but it's still at that, we're at that dawn, and I think this is an exciting time because a lot of things had to happen. Uh, telematics, uh, GPS, Wi-Fi, all these things weren't really there yet, and now they all are, so it's a really great opportunity. And then what that means for cities, for street allocation, how do we allocate that space to allow those things to flourish because it really can't all be off street. There's going to be a lot of on-street interaction. And those funding partnerships are going to be critical, uh, as um, Sharon mentioned before. So all these three things are really what we're trying to focus on, which is building better cities. We want positive behavioral change. A lot of the academic uh, world has studied this and found that there's a lot of causality with positive behavioral change with these things if we do them right. We'll see improvements in public health. We'll see a more efficient system that's not being subsidized in certain um, modes that, that makes the whole system inequitable. Um, and we're trying to make more effective mobility. So these are the kind of the key policy areas that we'll be focusing over the next few days in the various sessions. So really looking forward to continuing that conversation. So here is what our world looks like in governance. A um, little psychedelic, a little San Francisco. Um, but uh, all over the world, you know, we've synthesized this from all of our discussions with many cities. Our constituency in the center is very diverse. Diverse mobility needs, diverse uh, uh, age group, lifestyles, et cetera. And they have different needs. And then we look at these transportation modes. And within those transportation clusters, there's a lot of things that need to be ironed out. We're not clear yet with the taxi, limousine, and transportation network companies piece on the top left. We've got the traditional bike, walk, transit, uh, and driving piece, which is a lot of contesting on the street for space. We have the, the, the vehicle sharing pods, bike sharing, car sharing, um, scooter sharing. How do they all fit? How do they co-locate? Can they all be one? Our traditional public transit on the left, the growth of the corporate and local shuttles uh, in the bottom left, and then the connections. The, the, so that's the city piece, but then we have to connect to the regional and interregional system, which is the high-speed rail, the airport, all that sort of stuff. So, you know, plan engineers can are justifiably a little feeling overwhelmed right now. So, you know, one of our jobs really is to connect the customers and connect the dots make it fair and so that it's, we have a fair playing field for everybody and not over-regulate one and under-regulate the other, but try and make it fair and, and have you know, a really, really clear uh, set of rules. And then really just join those dots so that the whole thing works for, for the customer's experience. So this is about 100 pages of research in one slide, um, but that's really what we're trying to, trying to figure out. 
Um, and we're not there yet by any stretch of the imagination. We've, ju we've just started this, this process. So, you know, our transportation system has a lot of modes. Um, unfortunately, they're, they're not integrated um, and they're not really talking to each other to the extent that they need to. Here is the, the, the world that most transportation agencies understand. And they kind of get it because there's been a lot of evolution over the last two or three decades. We understand the street allocation of space somewhat better than we used to. We understand public transit has a role. And we, we understand these regional intercity connections. But here are the three that are kind of tipping everything up and, and you know, really f making people think, think much broader than they have. What's our role in, in these um, shared fleet vehicles? You know, I, you know, we have to commend and, and, and applaud the pioneers who really cut their teeth on this stuff and risked a lot of um, financial risk and burden to, to prove these concepts and make proof of concepts. So, and you know, cities didn't really have that much involvement in it, but we're benefiting from these as, as Susan's research has shown. And so how are we going to uh, incorporate these modes into our lexicon of thinking? Our transportation system at the local, state, and federal level hasn't really acknowledged these yet, so we really need to figure out how we're going to acknowledge these. And then my favorite piece is, you know, how does this work for the customer? And right now we have about 12 different smart cards, a lot of smart cards, a lot of smart keys, a lot of smart fobs, um, a lot of maps, a lot of apps, um, all these different things. Um, if you actually have all these smart cards together, you end up with a really fat, dumb wallet. So um, this is not good. So we have smart apps and smartphone and dumb wallet. And so we need to figure, out, figure this out. And you know, it just makes it really frustrating for the, for the customer who is thinking about, well, maybe I will not drive because I've heard all these good stories about all these different things. But when they want to do all these multiple modes because people tend to want to move around in different ways, it's going to be, it's, it's a real challenge right now. It's, it's actually really hard. And the early adopters and the, the greeny, you know, we call them the greeny granola uh, ecotypes, we've already captured that market. Everybody else who is the, the, the mainstream, this is really difficult for them to, to take on. So we have the technology, we have the technical capabilities, we all need together in this room figure this out and make it easy. So uh, we had some fun, and I'm going to show some, some vision concepts. Um, but here is what we could physically do today because we have the technology. We just have to overcome some of these policy and um, technical barriers and, um, to data. So here is the world of the modes that we have. Uh, understandably, not putting helicopters in, Susan, yet. But here is what we have. Um, and we have this device. And they're getting smarter, and they're going to be made of graphene soon. They'll wrap around your hand. Who knows what they'll look like, right? But the point is, the communication device from Star Trek is here. So we have it. Now what we have to do is we have to integrate, the, integrate them for the customer's experience. So all these modes have to be able to talk to each other and talk to one interface so that the routing is interconnected, the booking is interconnected, the payments are interconnected, and this allows for credits and offsets. We could do gamification, having games where people actually can trade their credits, et cetera, really level the playing field for certain disadvantaged communities. Um, this doesn't have to be just on the smartphone. It can be on a computer. It can be on many sites at a kiosk. And then the gaming opportunity and the value add for those uh, marketing people here, there's a lot of opportunities to do this. What does it look like? It could look like this, where you have um, uh, your basically your trip. I'm, I'm here. I want to go there. You click on it, press go. It gives you the option, what mode, what time. Are you time sensitive? Are you price sensitive? You know, is it a nice day out today? Do you want to use a, a mode? Is there a credit or a debit system available? You choose it, and you go, and it's that easy. So that's what we need to have if we really want people to move away from, from this driving their own car all the time. Um, and then what does it look like? It could look like something like this, where you have the, the car sharing, bike sharing, scooter sharing, whatever they are, whether they're fleet owned or managed, whether it's a taxi service, whether it's a TNC, it doesn't really matter. But the point is that we've allocated the space on the street and the sidewalk, and that the customer is linked via their app and there's their geo position, and they can get around the city that makes sense. If they want to go out and have a party that night and get, you know, not want to drive, maybe the driverless car drives them back. You know, who knows? But here are the possibilities. You want to pique your interest about this so you can think big. Scaling up, you know, we have about 1,000 or 2,000 sites right now, but this is what 12,000 sites looks like just for San Francisco. And we're going to need to think that way in terms of uh, citywide for all around the world. How do we scale this up? And how do we get that? And to do that, we need to rethink our streets. This is how we look at our streets right now. 
um, you know, pretty much dominated for the, the single passenger car, sometimes bike lanes, sometimes bus lanes. But if we're really going to think this through, and if we're gonna really going to take on the development that we want to do in cities, and as Sharon mentioned, people moving to cities more often, we need to look at our streets in a very different way. And we've started that somewhat. There's some, uh, some movement ahead in, in you know, North, uh, northern European cities. Some North American cities are, are, are really trying to pioneer this. We have a lot of policy obstacles and barriers to get through this, um, reallocating existing right-of-way for bicycles and for transit and for corporate shuttles and the different sharing services. That's going to be a challenge. It's going to be a, a challenge neighborhood by neighborhood. But I think with the, the right data and the right messaging, I think we're going to get there. But you're seeing this now in many cities. Paris, for example, is probably one of the leaders in this. Barcelona, Berlin, in Europe. In the U.S., we've got New York, Chicago, uh, um, San Francisco is, is really trying to move things forward. Um, Portland, for example, there's, there's a few cities that are trying to really grapple with this, but it's looking at the, the areas outside the intersection, which is the land use that creates those trips and those activity centers, and then how do we allocate that space? And in some corridors, it may be rapid transit-only lanes. In other corridors, it may be shared lanes. I mean, it's really up to us to, to figure this out, but we're going to need to rethink these streets. So when we do all this together, we should start seeing some of these four key elements that, that can work with each other. With our focus on increasing options, our quality of life will improve, even as we, um, you know, paradoxically, in some people's minds, densify and intensify. We will see more options. We'll see increased public health. We'll see better usability for the customer so they can get around. And we're going to make travel fun. When was the last time traveling was fun? We want to make it fun to get, to get around. Um, this will result in more system efficiency. We'll see reduced congestion, especially if we start seeing things like driverless cars auctioning their time and space on the allocation of the street. Things like that will help us get around. All the other ride-sharing services that we've been talking about and the shared use services, those things actually do take cars off the street. I believe on average one car-sharing vehicle is between 9 to 11 vehicles off the, off the road. So. We're starting to see that uh, happening as well with bike sharing and, and probably with scooter sharing. So there's definitely some uh, congestion relief there. Um, also, we'll start seeing our vehicle types really morph. We won't have these large cars for every single use. You know, we can actually start having smaller cars and different types of vehicles. Um, maybe tricycles and three-wheeler and four-wheeler. You know, who knows what's going to happen? It's just a, it's a great time to think about this stuff. And then our mobility will become more sustainable. So in not just green and quiet and low carbon, but actually financially viable. You know, we, have, we have several modes of transport right now that are financially unsustainable, and we don't know how we're going to get ourselves out of this. So we really need to think this through in that there may be t ways to right-size our transportation systems around the world for each city that may or may not involve more public transit or more of these shared use services, or more or less, depending on where the corridors are, things that we need to really start having an open mind about because we're running out of money. Um, and we need to really think this through. And then to make the point not forgotten about accessibility, you know, this is really critical about accessibility, not just accessing community and getting around to different areas and your friends, but accessibility for all those who are not as able-bodied as, for example, myself, and how they can get around so we can create barrier-free access, have better connectivity, all different age groups um, and all user types, and it becomes more affordable. You know, these are really lofty, big goals, but that's what makes us um, uh, excited. And um, I think we're at the beginning of this conversation, and I really want to applaud Susan for her incredible work of getting you all together here. Um, we really believe that there's a lot of pieces to this. There's a lot of moving parts. There's plenty of room for everybody, and there's plenty of work for everybody. Um, I think we can grow tremendously, so there's plenty of space for all of you to really innovate and grow and show us um, how we can do it. And we're just so excited, and I just want to thank you all for, for being here. Thank you.